Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you to our partners over at Zai, a global fintech which is innovating within its area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non-native businesses. You can check them out at hellozai.com. Whether you're leading an organization through new realities, building or rethinking your career, forging new relationships, seeking peace, or simply not sure what to do next, you'll gain tools and insights for how to think, learn, work, live, and lead better with a Flux mindset. Flux shows you how to slow down responsibly, identify what really matters, make wise decisions, and let go of the rest. Flux challenges your assumptions and expectations in ways that enable you to lean into the future with hope rather than fear. We welcome the author of Flux, Eight Superpowers for Thriving in Constant Change, April Rinna. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Aiden. I am delighted to be here. It's great to finally have you with us, April. We've been planning this for ages and our diaries didn't align, but talk about the stars aligning. It's perfect timing, bang into a new year and good news for our audience as well. I have a copy of this beautiful book behind me up for grabs. Just sign up to the Innovation Show.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to win that. And if you don't win it, please buy a copy and don't forget to leave an Amazon and Goodreads review for April it really helps boost the algorithm and we're in this age of algorithms. So April, let's get into it. Your book gives readers an opportunity to prepare for seismic shifts. You say, in an ideal world, of course, change is a choice both individually and organizationally. If we are really lucky, we're even prepared for change. It's expected change, but nothing could have prepared you for a massive flux in your life on that early e evening of June 6th, 1994. Yes, so I am more than happy to uh, talk about kind of what I often call my baptism or my entry into flux. And it's interesting because I peel back the layers of my own story. How and when did I get so interested in this concept of change? And not just change, again, change that you can control, change that we like, that kind of change that just blindsides you, that kind of change that just completely throws your world upside down. And for me, I mean, back in 1994, I would not have imagined that I would write a book about all of this today, but that's when my journey really began. And so back in 1994, I will date myself, um, I was in college and I was studying actually in England. And um, that evening, I had just finished my studies for the year I got a phone call and the phone call was from my sister um, in the United States. And, you know, it was that classic, are you sitting down? And you have that moment of like, why should I be sitting down? Um, and it turns out that um, both of my parents had died in a car accident and I was 20 years old and it rocked my world. As you might imagine, like everything in that moment kind of melted, right? And not in that instant, but very shortly thereafter, I started thinking about what do I do? Like all of a sudden, I am not just feeling alone in the world, but I've got to figure out how do I re rebuild my family? How do I deal with my grief and anxiety? Um, what about my career? I had to become self sufficient. I had to grow up really fast. I had all of these things, but like the world as I'd known it prior was no longer. And I had very little choice but to walk through that fire, if you will. And then, you know, this is many, many years later, that journey, that path led me not only to be really interested about change and how people and organizations and cultures deal with change, but also to recognize that not only is there so much we can learn from one another, but that this is a phenomenon that every person is going to experience at some point in their lives, not hopefully or necessarily a tragedy with two deaths kind of thing, but this kind of change that we that just rocks our world. It's going to hit pretty much everybody in some way at some time. And so I realized there's a lot of value actually in sharing not just my own experience, but all of the research um, insights, observations, conversations, et cetera, that I learned over the years since then. I just want to recognize your parents as may they rest in peace, but also what a great legacy you are through this book, through the experiences, through all the lessons and wisdom that you're sharing 
they obviously did a magnificent job and you you do mention them countless times throughout the book but uh i think there's no better legacy for them than you and your book as well that it's it's paid forward and it's helping so many people so that's a that's a huge credit to you as well and to them may they rest in peace Thank you. And just a quick footnote there, and I don't want to sound too woo-woo too fast, but what's amazing is that they were such a part of my writing process. They really, and I know it's, you know, not to get too deep into this, but like, I know that they know the book exists. I know that they're proud. I know that they actually like what I wrote, even though, as you know, not all of what I share about them or my childhood or any of it, not all of it was easy. Not all of it was happy. Um, you know, I, I lost my best friend and I lost someone that was really challenging for me in one fell swoop. I lost, you know, you, you have these conflicting or even paradox kind of feelings and recognizing they helped me realize that you can hold, you can have ver- two very different feelings and they can o- both be legitimate and they can both be worth sharing and they can both be extremely valid or even essential to navigating change. So thank you. And I I do wish I could give them a copy, but I also know that had they not died, this book would not exist and it wouldn't be able to help others. What I found really interesting, April, was when you when you talk about some anecdotes here or there about how words of wisdom from your parents that would years later manifest and you didn't know what they meant at the time, which is usually the way. But it made me think, right, so I'm a parent, my kids are 12 and 8, and I I do stuff with them like... um, breathing exercises, for example, or that, you know, when we go to the swimming pool, they'll see me taking a, a freezing cold shower. And they're like, oh, God, that guy's a nut job. What's he doing? <laughs> the shower's warm, dad, just here's here's how it works. And and I've, I, I wanted to teach them that the way to prepare for stress is actually introduce it on your own terms. So that's the whole idea of the cold shower. I have a cold shower, I expect it, I train myself to expect it. So if I did get thrust into freezing cold water, it wouldn't be such a shock to me. And I felt really that's what your book does. And that's how it's like a an echo of the work that your parents did is they prepared you for a world that they believed in the best way they poss- possibly could. And that's what you're doing with this book. And I thought that that's what you're doing. You're helping others go, look, change is inevitable, but you can prepare for it. And that's what this book is about. Mm, I love how you say that, Aiden. Thank you. And well done with the showers and your kids. One thing I will mention, and this has been, I don't want to say a total surprise since the book's been out, but it has caught me off guard in terms of just the amount of energy and interest and feedback that I've had. And that is um, how many parents have come to me and said, so if you know, listeners are, are, have kids of your own where they're like, how do I get this to my kids? right? Like these flux superpowers, this ability, like I get that I need a lot of this as an adult, but I'm reading this book. I'm listening to the audiobook, and I just want to share it with my kids, but, but they won't necessarily read a book. So stay tuned. There's more on that front, but just the, the kind of agelessness of it and the way that each person can take it on their own. I will also say that the age of 20 is really an interesting age in which in my case, you know, I was old enough to be away at university and I knew how to care for myself day to day, but technically I was still a dependent of my parents, right? And at 20, you know, I had worked, I had definitely, as, as the book tells, like I started my first business when I was eight, like I, I was a go-getter, but I really had very little idea of how the world worked or my role in it really. And so there's this interesting age and, you know, I say 20, give or take, right? There's sort of secondary school, college, but you're swinging within this like, okay, I'm on my own, but I'm still really quite green. How do I, how do I find my way forward? And what was fascinating for me was that um, the experience of my parents' deaths and whatnot, it forced me, in retrospect, I look back and I say, I had the equivalent of a midlife crisis when I was 20 because everything sort of shattered and I had to ask the questions of, you know, if I were to die tomorrow, what does the world need me to do today? Is my life going to be of meaning and purpose and all of that? And those are the questions, those are the questions that many years later, I see people who are going through some kind of crisis asking. And I realized that having to ask those way back when, as hard as it was, actually turned out to be very helpful because it 
nudged me to make very different decisions about my priorities, about what mattered, about how I live the day to day, but also how I set longer term goals, et cetera. So I bring that up multiple levels, one being parents, another being, you know, younger people have really, 20 somethings have really resonated with the book as well, because they can see themselves in the me that began the book. And that's been really nice because I don't work in education. I don't work with a lot of young people typically, but it's one of the audiences I'm really keen to serve. When you have these forced tragedies, it, it, it forces you towards action. And what I love about what you've done is you've made sense of it. You've written your own script that makes sense. And I think that's I think it's so therapeutic and writing is so therapeutic in that way. And as you say, your parents are in those pages. They were they were your muse as well as, you know, as as giving you ideas before they passed. But um, I wanted to talk about one thing, which is the word flux itself, because this is you said to me off air before we came on, you battled with the title of the book and flux because you're a word nerd, which is so obvious throughout the book. <laughs> I love word nerds, by the way, I love the origin and etymology of words. And you certainly do that as well throughout the book. But flux has a beautiful origin. The word flux, and it's quite funny, too, we could have a separate conversation on the international sort of alliterations, manifestations, as we're dealing with foreign translations, that's actually quite fun. Because flux is this word that most people know, but they're kind of like, what is it exactly like? It's fun to say lots of riffs, right? Like your flexibility and your fluxiness and what the flux. And I mean, we could, we could have, it's, that's, that's quite fun. But going back to just the basics, the word flux is both a noun and a verb. And so as a noun, which is how most people know it, it means continuous change or movement, right? It's just a kind of the flux being in the flux. It's, it's just stuff is constantly changing. Um, I will also mention that the other best known um, definition for it today is as is in metallurgy and jewelry making. Um, and the flux, flux is the binding. It's the chemical binding agent that matches the jewel with the metal. Or if you do stained glass, the piece of glass in the metal casing. And I bring that up just because people say, wait, what about that definition? And it's also really beautiful when you think about nesting something beautiful into something strong. So flux is just the name of that agent. So anyway, continuous change, movement, um, that's the noun. But flux is also a verb. And to flux means to learn to become fluid. And I love that kind of juxtaposition, that tension of the world is in flux and that we all need to learn how to flux a little better. Yeah, it's a great word. And I wanted to get some of the context because these are kind of lenses through which to read the book that are very important before we get into the superpowers. One of the other key concepts is the concept of scripts, writing new scripts, getting rid of old scripts, tearing up the old one that no longer served you. And you say, in many ways, the script cheers you on for achieving goals set by society. By and large, it doesn't ask what you want. It takes care of that for you. Perhaps you've tried to consult your inner voice about this, but your script drowned out that voice. In fact, for this script to work, your inner voice must be silent. I thought we'd say a word on scripts because it's such an important concept for the book. And in a way, the eight superpowers are the new script. They're the powers through which to write your new script. They're your ink, if you will. So let me back up just briefly and kind of frame this in a one degree bigger context, which is the book overall is about humans' relationships to change. So people say, oh, you wrote a book about change or change management. And I'm like, with all due respect, I did not. I wrote a book about our relationships to change and how complicated and messy they can be. And that's a fact of the human condition, right? We tend to love changes we opt into. We tend to really struggle with changes we can't control. A change that's really easy for you might be really hard for me, vice versa. We know that more changes around the corner, yet knowing that often freaks us out, like, it's complicated. It's messy. Okay. How do we unpack that? Because, you know, this is where, again, just think about the last two years, no shortage of examples to point to. 
but I'm looking at this from a more, also a more timeless phenomenon in that there's more change, more uncertainty ahead. We've really got to wrap our arms and heads and mindsets around what a world in constant, relentless change is going to look like and how do we relate to it in order to be able to thrive. And so I firmly believe that in order to do that, we need to radically reshape our relationship to change and uncertainty um, to be fit for this world in flux. So within that, if you go back to like your relationship to change, what changes do you love? What do you hate? Uh, we can dig into more of, you know, where we take, where, where we go when we pull on that thread in a little bit, but a lot of our relationship to change comes down to what I call our script. Now our script is the norms and narratives and stories that we tell and that we've been taught and that we've been socialized within about how the world works and our place in it. It includes the stories we tell about change. So everything from were you taught to approach change from a place of hope or fear? Were you taught that uncertainty means danger? Or is it an adventure for your curiosity, right? But your script also includes things like success is to be found at the top of a corporate ladder. It's also something like don't trust other people. It's also something like more is better. Right? All of these things factor into our scripts. And for the most part, we're not aware of it. It's just kind of part of how we grow up. And it's a lot of unconscious stuff that we're told day after day. And that's, again, I should also give the caveat, like you have a script, I have a script, everyone has a script. Everyone's script is different because we have different life experiences. And I'm very cautious and careful to make it clear one script isn't better than another today, right? It's like, Everybody is unique. Everybody has great aspects about them and their script and challenges about their script. Um, and that's where we focus most of, of the book. But the challenge, the, the, the mega or meta challenge that we face today is that for every single person, as far as I can tell, um, and I don't want to generalize too much, but I've been pounding the pavement and researching and talking to people and traveling and observing and Every single person, there's some aspect of their relationship to change that isn't fit for the world we're in today. So what's happening is we've been taught all this stuff and we're looking at the world and saying, this does not align with the world as I see it, or it doesn't align with the kind of person I want to be in it, right? And so, wow, how do we get to this new script and the way I like to frame it as you, as you beautifully put it, is in many ways what I call the old script, your script today, has been written by other people for you. And it's also written primarily for a world that believes that humans can sort of command and predict and control change and the future and what happens, right? And we're trying to get to this new script that you are the author of your own script, and it is a script that is fit, again, fit for this world in flux, a world that humans don't control and predict. It's not a top-down engineered kind of future. It's a very human future with a lot of opportunity, but one that, again, requires us to make this mindset shift to lean into change, uncertainty, and flux. When you're talking about scripts, I, I think, you know, it really drives me with the work of the show, for example, is sharing scripts sharing information for people to d decide whether that fits my script or does that help me or give me a mental model but there's a bigger picture then as well which is when you have enough humans writing their scripts you change the script of the planet and then you create a new collective consciousness and everybody changes together and brings everybody with them i think that's the other thing is if you get this kind of raising in consciousness you, you help others who maybe don't have the privilege of that, who, who don't have the skill sets, who, who have been born into maybe detrimental situations where they just haven't had any education, but, but by educating everybody else, you can help them, you know, and that's a, that's a huge kind of noble cause behind, I feel that behind this type of work is you help, as you, you say in the book, you help the individual, that helps the organization, but that also helps society on a whole as well. But I wanted to get to an, one last key point before we get into the superpowers. And this is, I suppose, from a from a, a physical or physiological perspective, it's the importance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic 
nervous system and understanding them because they play a huge role when it comes to the superpowers in the background. They're, you know, we're unaware of them a lot, but they're ticking away in the background. So I kind of want to pick up on both of these because what you said about the the societal implications, I can't, I can't just let that one go past because um, it's also worth noting that even this book, when I think about, I like to say that it was the better part of three, three years in the act of writing, but more like three decades in the act of creation. Many of those years were spent actually working in more in broadly speaking, global development. So I spent a lot of time working with the economically active poor. I spent a lot of time working in urban slums. I spent a lot of time trying to um, deal with systemic inequalities and disconnects in terms of how people and how potential and talent and all of that is seen. And I, I bring that up only because I was that that is a very important piece that I bring to this book, both in terms of how do we see things like inequality, injustices, et cetera, but also that the book, I love to say this, and this is just a, a sweeping statement, but in order to develop a flux mindset, in order to develop these flux superpowers, it does not require anything you don't already have. It doesn't require any money you may or may not have. It doesn't require any technology you may or may not have. So much of what this book talks about comes down to human agency and wisdom that we've all had for a very long time, but it has been buried and sort of bulldozed by a lot of external forces. And so a lot of what the book is trying to help us do is kind of uncover and rediscover what we've always known but what has been very easy, and we can get into this later of how it happened, but um, you know how it has actually been forgotten knowledge along the way. So it is very true. We, we decided, you know, I had to start with the individual of like your flux mindset, your relationship to change. But it is very, very clear, as you said, every organization is simply a collection of individuals. Every community is a collection of individuals. Society, cultures, human humanity as a whole, it's a collection of individuals. So as we have that cascading out or that kind of ripple effect out, that is that is my longer term hope for the book. So um, back to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Yes. So we have these two nervous systems that are, you know, they've always worked in tandem, but you've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is basically that fight, flight, freeze, action oriented um, a nervous system. And then you have the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest and calm down and relax kind of um, system. And, and when they're in balance, you kind of know which one needs to be activated, to so to speak. Um, I'm simplifying a little bit here. But the challenge that we're facing, because coming back to change, um, you know, it's not just how much is changing. And we can point to personal changes and professional changes and societal changes and organizational changes and schedule changes and travel changes and pandemic changes. I mean, right, there's just no shortage there. It's also the pace of change and how fast things are changing. The way I like to say this is that the pace of change has never been as fast as it is today. And yet it is likely to never again be this slow. And when you let that sink in, and I say this as a futurist, right, kind of looking to the future and going, oh, my gosh, if you think things are moving fast today, what if you were to imagine that tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, that's kind of the trajectory that we're on. That is kind of exciting that the pace of change is increasing every day. It's also, I would say, a bit terrifying, right? And this factors directly into some of the superpowers. Back to the nervous system, so. Our nervous systems are not designed for faster, 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 more, 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 more. Oh my goodness, right? We are starting to treat not everything, but far too many things from a fight, flight, or freeze perspective, meaning that's what brings out anxiety. That's what, if you go back in human history, you know, if a tiger is chasing you, that's what activates the sympathetic nervous system. We now live in a way that's almost like we think everything is a tiger chasing us, and it completely hijacks not just our nervous system's ability to, 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 to work in sync and in balance, but it also makes us um, not identify the kinds of changes that we're experiencing in an accurate human-centric way. And then again, like you say in the book as well, when you're, when you're moving so fast and taking care of that to-do list, which is often important but not urgent, we often put to the side the stuff that's really important and urgent that but we just actually put it push it away 
And the other thing is we miss things. Like, just like you're in fight or flight, you, you miss hear, hear things, you miss see them, or you don't see them at all. And that's a huge point. And then to get to the bigger ambition of global change in consciousness or helping people rewrite their scripts, you can't do that when you're not aware of how you are physically as well. So I think that's one of the reasons I just wanted to really mention that. It's so important when it comes to the flux mindset. You say the first step in putting the theory of flux into action is to open a flux mindset itself. A flux mindset sees the change, sees all change as an opportunity, not a threat, by being clear and grounded in your values. And you tell us a flux mindset has several essential elements, including core values, comfort with paradox, and the ability to see uncertainty from a place of hope rather than fear. Perhaps we'll share this and then we might jump into uh, the shifts from the old mindset to a flux mindset. And here, just a, a brief tangent, but for those particularly in the business world, I find it's often quite helpful. Um, so much of this and what the book talks about is from the inside out. It's our inner relationship with change. And navigating change well, I like to think of it, you know, it's both art and science, right? And similarly, knowing how to flux requires having both the right strategy to some degree and also the right mindset. And specifically, it is this mindset that can see every single change. And here I talk about big or small, expected or unexpected, especially the hard stuff, especially the change that blindsides you, especially the change that you don't want to have happen. It sees all of it as an opportunity to grow, to learn, and to improve. And yet, in my experience and over the past you know, few decades, what I see more often than not is that humans, we get this relationship backwards, right? What I mean by that is we focus on developing change management strategies. We worry about investing in uncertainty. We're worried about what's going to happen in the outside world. But what we fail to recognize or even realize sometimes is that every single strategy or investment or decision you make about anything, all of it is rooted in your mindset. So back to what I was saying before, do you see change from a place of hope or fear? That's not strategy, that's mindset. Do you expect things will go to plan and then kind of get anxious or unravel or your sympathetic nervous system kicks into gear when they don't? That's not strategy, that's mindset, right? So. I'm not saying that strategy doesn't matter. I'm saying that mindset drives strategy, not the other way around. And so long as we're worried and focused on what to do in the outside world, so you know, develop this strategy, engineer this particular outcome, et cetera, et cetera, but we fail to recognize that all of this is shaped and colored and driven, if you will, by our complex, complicated, messy relationship to change, we'll constantly be putting the cart before the horse. So I love that because it kind of takes us back to really fundamental human essentials and how you relate to change. Because when you have a flux mindset, the book also goes into this a little bit, um, it gives you a kind of clarity. Now, it doesn't automatically have all the answers, but when you're clear on what drives you and how you relate and react to certain kinds of changes, it helps you identify, oh, what's going on here? when anxiety kicks in? What's going on here when you're resisting a change? What's going on here when you see someone else resisting a change that you just, you just want them to come along, right? You just want them to cooperate. You start realizing that human relationships and human, including our relationships with ourselves, are really at the heart of all of this. And it's where we need to start as we move forward. April, I'd love to share the shifts in mindset because I often think of, you mentioned Heraclitus, many times throughout the book, the Greek philosopher who was the ultimate fluxer, if you want to call him that. And uh, one of his great quotes that I love is that no man ever walks in the same river twice, because it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. And the concept is that he's constantly in flux. So is the river. So the environment essentially changes as does the person. And I thought about this as a nice, nice way to frame the shifts in mindset, because Yes, individually, I need to change, but also the environment's changing. So there's a, a change in the needed skills for the environment. And I think this table that I'm going to share on YouTube for those people who are watching us 
for people who are not watching this on YouTube, we'll do our best to explain it. Well, April, you, you will. <laughs> I'm sure you're used to it. So maybe we'll open this. I'm going to share it now. It's opening a flux mindset. The, the columns to think about this are, how do you see, for example, your life so story? There's a change from an old mindset to a new mindset, which is the flux mindset in how do you see your life story? That's the way each of these are teed up. So over to you, April, I'll get out of the way. And just to be clear, I came up with this uh, framework diagnostic, you know, this, this table really as a kind of um, it's guidance. It's I think of it as scaffolding upon which each person can hang a bunch of different stuff. Right. It's not this is not prescriptive of like you must do X and cannot do Y. It's more like, how do you think about these things? And so is your life story or your script, is it written by other people for you to follow or is it written by you? You're the author of your own script as something you wish to become. So are you the author of your own life? Are you writing your own book of life, right? Then we look at things like, how do you see life itself? And again, echoing back a little bit to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, the old mindset or the older script would see life as a kind of ladder to climb. It's linear, success is at the top, and it's kind of lockstep. Everyone's trying to do the same thing. Um, the flux mindset would see life very much as a flowing river that, again, is itself changing. And anytime you step into it, you are a different person as well. And that's a beautiful thing because you're a constantly evolving, changing, emerging, growing individual. Um, in a similar light, how do you see your career? So here, again, the old mindset would see it as a path to pursue. You have a career path that is pretty linear. Maybe th you think of it as a ladder again to climb, but it is, you know, I'm going to study hard, get good grades, get a job, do said job for a long time, retire. It's very linear. It's very prescriptive. Now, the flux mindset would see your career more as a portfolio that you curate, as an artist would curate their portfolio or an investor would curate their portfolio. But your career is a portfolio of skills and roles and opportunities that you help design. Now, it includes jobs. It also includes things that you might go launch on your own. It's much more customed, customized to what you're good at doing, what you enjoy doing, and how you can contribute to society in meaningful ways. Then we've got, um, how do you see expectations, right? Um, again, there's an internal, external command and control versus emergent uh, tension, I would say, in a lot of these. So here again, expectations. The old mindset would say that expectations are determined by other people externally, right? A flux mindset would say that the expectations I set for myself, they're determined internally by me. Now, I realize I want to contribute to society, but I'm going to be doing things that I believe are important to do, not doing things simply because someone else tells me it's important or someone else tells me that's what will make me successful or make me matter to others. Similarly, um, how do you set goals? How do you think about goals? Uh, the old mindset would say that goals are kind of, you know, set in concrete, <laughs> so to speak. They're, they're pretty fixed and um, they're often hard to attain. They're, so like, I set this goal, I want to achieve it. And if I don't achieve it, I've somehow failed. That's very much old school, um, old mindset. The flux mindset would actually see goals as very emergent. Um, oftentimes, they're not crystal clear on day one. You know, you're working towards something, but you can't quite define it. You learn to define it in the journey so much more as a journey that's not fixed. Um, yet it's really, really rich with opportunity because when you see goal setting as a journey, you're discovering things all along the way, as opposed to, again, in the old mindset, you've got this one thing that's out there. And if you don't achieve it again, you failed. It's much more of a bind, sort of binary versus um, a richer spectrum of the flux mindset. Then we've got measurements of success. How do you measure success? Um, I would argue that the old mindset will measure success and whether you're successful either by rungs of the ladder. So like how far did you climb up that ladder of life or how much money is in your bank account, for example. Um, flux mindset is not actually going to look at it that way at all. It's going to say rungs of a ladder and amount of money. Those are, those are just concepts that humans have developed that have no meaning beyond that which we give them. 
it would look at measurement, a flux mindset would look at, me, at measurements of success much more um, along the lines of next steps, new insights, peeling back the layers of the onion. What did we learn yesterday and how can that improve how we show up today? Then we've got, how do you think about leadership? Um, leadership here, again, probably not surprisingly, I think a lot of what many of us were taught, including myself, uh, growing up is, you know, the leader is the person at the top. The leader is the person that kind of manages and controls other people. The leader is the leader sometimes has a big ego, right? Um, in a flux world, leadership is actually not about you and your ego and who is the one leader at the top. A great leader in a world in flux is actually the leader, the person that can identify and harness leadership in others. So it's a much more of a collective approach. And here we can think of the me versus we Old mindset would be leadership is all about me. Flux mindset would be leadership is all about we and the community and the collective. Um, similarly, there's there's kind of a parallel between leadership and power. Um, how we look at power is is very quite very much similar. Uh, in an old old mindset, you would look at power as um, top down and something to be guarded and protected, sort of a fortress mentality. Um, a flux mindset is going to see power very much from a bottom-up and dispersed uh, perspective. How do you look at your peers? Um, old mindset would say your peers are your competitors. A flux mindset would say your peers are your allies and your collaborators. How do you set your vision? What kind of vision are you trying to set as a leader or just as, as a person trying to become a better you every day? Um, the old mindset would be would say that vision comes with certainty. You're going to make a plan. You're going to achieve it. That's that's certainty of a vision, so to speak. Um, a flux mindset would say that you know no one can predict or command or control the future. We don't really know what's going to happen, but the kind of vision we're looking for is actually clarity. So clarity of purpose, clarity of meaning, um, clarity of doing what really matters. Coming almost to the end of the list, um, how do you see change? The old mindset would see change as a threat. A flux mindset would see change as an opportunity. And last but not least, what are the emotions that you have associated with change? An old mindset would often see change from a place of fear or anxiety, um, even paralysis, right? You're frozen by change. And a flux mindset would actually see change from a place of hope, wonder, and curiosity. And even if it's a change you don't want to see happen, you can still see it from a place of curiosity, from a place of hope, and this sense of there's still something really good that can come out of this change, even if it's not something that I expected or wish to have happen, I'm still going to learn how to grow and improve. So that is a bit of a download, but Beautiful. there is, the, uh, there is the, the chart in a nutshell. Thanks so much. I appreciate you going through it all, and I hope it's useful for our audience because th this is all preparing you for now the the superpowers there's there's one last piece that's important and in the time of releasing this show like new year lots of people have new toys to play with including those health trackers for example or a heart rate tracker and one thing that's really important when you get anything new like that is to set a baseline and you suggest the same thing as for the flux mindset you need to set your baseline so you can actually and you can actually think about this as you read the book and you revisit and kind of go that's where I was. Where am I now? What's changed for me as I've unlocked insights, etc. How do we do this, right, April? Because this is an important step before we launch onto the flux journey. So you bring up two really good points here. One is this whole notion of New Year and just a kind of like, yes, this can be part of your. I'm not a fan of resolutions, but your intentions around the New Year. I'm going to improve my relationship to change, and I have this, you know, handy kind of playbook or guidebook or you know companion to help me do it. So the flux baseline, and it's, it's interesting. I, I don't want this to sound like a book, a, a book pitch per se, but it's like, you kind of do need to read the book because it's detailed there with a series of questions. I think of the flux baseline as a diagnostic, right? It's not, there's not a right or a wrong answer. It's simply trying to figure out what is my relationship to change? How is it? And you know, everyone's is uniquely theirs, right? So I cannot pre predict or predict, profess to know what yours is or anyone else's per se, but it's a process whereby you're asking, asking yourself questions that build your self-awareness and can place you 
on, if you will, the spectrum of flux that then helps you identify which of the superpowers is most helpful for you to start with learning. Um, and so it really is, it's asking a series of questions that it digs into, again, what kinds of changes do you love? What kinds of changes do you hate? When and where did the seeds of these reactions get planted? That's really interesting because kind of like I was saying earlier about our scripts, what, one of the things that I've learned in the last 25 plus years is that you know, everyone's relationship to change is different, but for the most part, our relationships begin young. So much of how we think about change and are conditioned to believe about change comes from our childhood. We weren't really paying attention to it. And it wasn't that some adult had it out for us or anything like that. It's just what we were absorbing. And one of the most interesting things on this journey to flux that, you know, my own journey to flux is to realize how rarely we talk about these things, how rarely we really sit and think about where did this come from? Because usually it ends up, it always catches up with us, right? Our relationship to change ends up making us feel anxious, getting us into trouble. We don't feel our best self. That's an invitation to unpack where did this begin? And so setting that flux baseline also goes back to that point of like, where did all of this start? And what might some of those other things be that I need to reconcile? And in my talks with people, it's been fascinating. It's everything from, you know, as a child, I realized when my, not me, but some, you know, I've, I've spoken to people who have said, you know, when my parents divorced, that was a disruptive change that actually ended up coloring how I see change, particularly change in relationships moving forward. I never resolved that. I had to go back and think about a parent's divorce or a family that moved. They moved from, from one city or, or one country to another, a kind of disruptive change that, that left them, that taught them many wonderful things about change. And then there was, oh, that served me well through life. So it's those kinds of things that feed into your flux baseline. And then you use that to move forward and take a look at the at the superpowers. Beautiful. I, I was a student of not not in person, but wherever I could find his content, Wayne Dyer, who passed away recently, magnificent man. And he had a beautiful saying that I, I really live by and I try to give it to as a lens through which f my kids can see experience. And it's simply that change what you see and what you see changes. And I, I love that from perspectives like you just mentioned there, where my reality will change based on my information that impacts my thoughts because my thoughts become a reality. And that type of thing, like, what's the origin of my crankiness around this instance or when somebody talks about this? What is at the heart of that? Those kind of things are so useful to unpack and that's why I, I like the book and the aspects that you, t you get into about these personal questions. You know, each chapter is packed full of these questions where April suggests we ask ourselves these questions, sit quietly in a room and just think about these things because they're so important to unpacking where we're going next. Speaking of where we're going next, we're going to get into the eight superpowers now. And these are the essential disciplines and practices that are fit for a world in flux that are applied and integrated into your life to give you the flux mindset. And you start in the book with running slower. And this is linked to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And you beautifully say here, in the workplace, human resources leaders often argue that when uncertainty looms, it's necessary to fire fast. When you're not sure where revenue will come from, the easiest thing to do is reduce your th team. After all, Salaries are the lar single largest line item for most organizational budgets. Yet, if we dig into the research, we learn that the opposite is true. Since 1980, companies that delay layoffs as long as possible perform better over time than companies that fire fast. It turns out that not only is the top talent hard to replace, but layoffs are devastating to the morale and productivity of the team that remains as well. Organizations that place economic efficiencies over fundamental fairness end up showing their true cards. Values and trustworthiness are hard to recoup. I thought that was so apt. And bearing in mind that you started writing this before the pandemic, where many organizations use crises such as the financial downturn or the pandemic 
as ways to reduce their staff and try to get people onto, for example, freelance contracts so they don't have to pay them quite as much and they don't have to manage them on all those kind of things. And we're seeing that at the moment. And this is why it's so important to be able to run slower, to be able to see more. Wow, let's dive right in. And let me, I'll, I'll share a little bit more context about the superpowers, but the run slower one, uh, chapter one is a really good place to start. And you're right. I mean, it's interesting. I was writing this book long before COVID hit. I was writing this book long before the great resignation hit. I was writing this book, you know, and yet there's, there are definitely seeds across the book where, and I don't want to, you know, sound like I'm on some kind of soapbox, but like I saw this coming. Um, and this is where to, we shared my story, you know, my personal story about change, but I would say more recently, you know, the last several years, most people know me as a futurist, right? Where I'm, I'm trying to help organizations figure out where is the future heading and how do we fit into it, right? And so in the world of futurism, we knew a pandemic was coming. We didn't know when we didn't, you know, but it, it's one of those things that as a futurist, you're looking on the horizon saying, what are the forces that could completely disrupt us, right? As a futurist, I can also say I'm looking the future of work future of work and learning are probably that's that's the area that i focused on most pre-pandemic and you knew that we were going to be reaching a tipping point you knew that we could not keep pushing 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 talent like we are in terms of productivity and in terms of defining oneself one's identity by what do you do and how far have you climbed up that ladder and all that. like you looked at this and you said at some point this system the system starts to crack. I won't say it breaks out right, but you start looking at, you know, fractures. And the great resignation is exactly that, right? It's not something that just happened in the last year. The, the forces that are behind the great resignation, these have been building for years, if not decades. And so as a futurist too, you know, we're looking to the future saying, okay, so how do we, how do we grow through this? And design different business models, different systems, but also different expectations about what work means, et cetera, et cetera. So back to run slower, um, framing it in this futurist kind of perspective, um, I would encourage you to go back to your script. Think about what your script typically tells you. It says that, and think about what I was saying earlier about the pace of change, right? It's increasing. It's never been as fast as it is today, and yet it'll likely never be this slow. Now think about what your script typically says. It says that when the pace of change increases, you need to run faster. You need to just keep up. And that from a leadership perspective, making fast decisions is smart. You got to act fast, right? I'm going to venture to say wrong. <laughs> and that is that if we already know that the pace of change is increasing, and many people are already running as fast as they can. And here we'll come back to the HR situation. HR leaders are running as fast as they can. CEOs are running as fast as they can. I mean, it is, it is at every level, right? Yet what is society telling us? Society is saying that no matter how fast you're running today, no matter how fast you're trying to react, no matter how much you're trying to do, you should expect and you should run even faster tomorrow, faster the day after that, faster next week and next month and next year, and all of this effectively for the rest of your life, right? I'm looking at this as a futurist and as, as a human being. And I'm like, like, time out, hold on, stop. What is going on? Like, this is becoming a kind of manic collective hamster wheel. At best, this kind of system leads to anxiety and burnout and exhaustion. At worst, you know, my real concern is that it leads to none of us reaching our full potential. That's not just you. That's every single one of your colleagues. If you're a CEO, every single one of your direct reports, your entire company, it means your friends, your family, your kids, like everyone is on, is in this system, part of this hamster wheel. But now you'll notice I, I didn't say stop. I didn't say be lazy. <laughs> I didn't say do nothing. I said run but run at a pace you can sustain for life. Because again, there are strategic reasons to do this. There are health reasons to do this. But we've become so obsessed, if you will, with running ever faster, ever faster, ever faster. What we're failing to recognize or to see is that when you run ever faster, ever faster, you actually run right past life. You actually fail to see what really matters, but you fail to appreciate being in the here and now as well. 
I was thinking about that, but, you know, the whole thing about running faster and sometimes running, as you say, running past your own life. And I think those moments where there's an inkling deep inside of us where it says, you know, April, it's time for a change here or Aiden, it's time for a change. We all have them and we often drown those out, those those inner voices. And, you know, that's why I thought it was so important about the whole idea of the understanding to give yourself time to settle so you can hear yourself so you can actually listen to the inner voice. And I thought about that even from an appreciation perspective, like the privilege that we have, some people are like, well, well, when you when you ask yourself deeper questions, like, why do I work? Oh, I work for to be able to provide for my family. And you're kind of going, yeah, but you never see them you're always working. So you kind of start to answer questions like that. I, I, I apply the Toyota five whys to myself, the agile approach and kind of go, why is that Aiden? Why is that? And I go deeper and deeper and deeper and go, ah, okay, there's a source reason here. And there's always a source reason. But again, we prioritize so many of our, our external externalities over ourselves, our internalities. And one of the things I found was, um, from a like a good way to test this for myself was how many things have I got to do that are on my list that are family based or to do with home that are I've put on the long list versus something crops up in a working context and I'll do it straight away. And that that's a big thing. I think that that's a sign to kind of go, okay, I need to start looking after what's important. The main keep the main thing the main thing as they say. If I can just Please. add a little bit of my own history and context, and this was something I, I was going to, I knew I needed to mention at some point that uh, oftentimes people say to me, they're like, um, oh, you wrote a book about flux. You must have mastered all eight superpowers, right? That somehow I have figured it all out. And I'm like, no, I'm just exhibit A, right? I, I struggle with these things as much as the next person. I've been working on them for a long time. So I'm much better at running slower now than I was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But for me too, it's been a journey. And I spent most of my life trying to run ever faster, ever faster. And that was both to achieve, that was to be seen, you know, as successful in society's eyes. That was even, it got to the point where I sometimes simply ran faster, 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 because I didn't know anything else. I didn't know how to slow down. And then I realized this was many, many years ago, but again, it was on my journey to flex. I realized that I was sort of stuck on this vehicle that at some point it was going to crash or I was walking on a tight rope of, you know, just faster, faster, faster. And I realized it wasn't really sustainable. And I realized that it wasn't actually helping me be at my best self. And so I paused and then I started that pause allowed me to look around and realize how many other people were doing the same thing in their own way. And again, not judging them, just like, oh my goodness. And how all of us were in this fraught kind of, call it a hamster wheel, call it a vehicle that's going to crash, call it a tightrope. And yet no one was really paying attention to like, what is it that really matters to me? And so I bring this up because Um, my own experience, I did not start out (laughs) running slower. And what's interesting is after my parents died, there was this incredible sense of they died. I have to make something of my life run, just go as fast, like dive in. And also, and this is maybe a a bit of a tangent, but um, it tends to, it tends to pique people's curiosity when I I mentioned that um, after my parents died, because it had been such a shock and actually I did not know death before they died. Um, I had never been to a funeral. My first funeral ever was the funeral of both of my parents in which, you know, I like my sister and I physically buried them. So it was a bit of a shock to the system. And you can imagine that I developed a both, you know, very rational and very irrational, but very genuine belief that I didn't have long to live either. And so throughout my 20s, um, I did not believe that I had more than a year to live. And it was I was in good health. But I just believed it was my way of coping with like, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But if, and what it led me to believe is I don't have more than a year to live. How, what should I do with my time? What should I, how can I give back to society? What do I do? You know, if I don't have long, what makes my life worthwhile? And on the one hand, that led me to want to run really fast and do as much as I could, as fast as I could, et cetera. It also though started me 
on the path of realizing that, and here I don't want to sound too morbid, but for any of us, I mean, we all have fine, we all have finite time on this world, in this world, and no one knows how long we have, right? It's true. We might be gone tomorrow, any one of us. And so if you had one day left in your life, or if you were to die tomorrow, again, how would you want to spend today? I have not met a single person that's like, I would be running as fast as I could, we're doing as much as I can. No, you would actually be slowing down, focusing on those relationships that really matter, investing time in the people you love, all of those things that exactly to your point, we find it's all too um, easy or convenient sometimes to just gloss over. So just wanted to bring that up because it actually goes back to this interesting, I mean, I don't, I don't believe I'm going to, I don't believe today that I have less than a year to live, but it's always in the back of my mind, that kind of thinking, not to be morbid. What I find is that when you, when you realize you may not have much, much time left, it can actually be really empowering for what is it that I could actually do right now? I'm going to do those things that I've been putting off for a long time. I'm going to spend time with those people that I've been missing, et cetera. And so that's the kind of offering that this chapter has as well. It drives you to do things like, for example, never go to bed angry or mend those kind of awkward relationships you might have in your life, or at least make the attempt to where you can feel I did everything in my power on my side. Or one of the ones I often think about is, is, being kind when you're just leaving somebody's company because it might be the last time you ever see them again. And again, it's not morbid. It's just try and leave things complete where you can, you know, and uh, it's it's a nice way to live, I think, living that way. Not, and, and not a finite way of living, just actually kind of go, okay, you know, and you know, people think we're, we, we're never in the moment. We're constantly thinking, what should I do now? It just becomes part of the way you are when you when you have these things in your in your mental arson, arsenal. I think of them as life principles and whether you have a day left or 50 years left or more than that, right? With expanded lifetimes and all the rest, it's a way to live and it's a way to prioritize and sort of, again, going back to this grounding and what makes you, you and how you want to show up for others. And hopefully with time, you can help others show up in the way that, you know, is their best self as well. So that, again, that cascading bit. Anyway, yeah. I interrupted. Sorry. Not at all. Not at all. And actually, you're you're feeding them as as the superpowers feed each other. I'm. Th this is feeding me for superpower number two, which is to see what's invisible. And there's a beautiful, beautiful part that you taught me here from this chapter. And I let you un unpack the meaning, but I'm going to use it. And actually, you know, it's something. It dawned on me that it's something I hope to achieve when I have guests like you on the show is when I'm a host that I actually achieve this and the the saying will actually tee you up to explain what it means it's the beautiful greeting so ubona is that how you pronounce it so ubona so ubona april yeah yeah so so ubona again more etymology more cultural differences and how people see change and see one another around the world um, I love this word and it, it comes from South Africa where, you know, the various languages that are spoken, but Zulu is, um, the language that is spoken by the most, the greatest number of people. And, and Saubona is the Zulu greeting. It's how you say hello, but Saubona does not mean hello or good day. Saubona literally means I see you and I see all of you. I see your physical being in front of me. I see your hopes and your dreams and your worries and your pains. And, and I see all of you and I honor you and I'm grateful to be in your presence. And, um, I've worked quite a bit in South Africa. I've traveled there, you know, and, and I first learned of this word when I would be, you know, getting into taxis or going into shops and I heard the word and then started unpacking it and was like, oh my goodness. Why can't we come up with better language? And with all due respect to hello, I'm like, hello, I don't even know what that means. I mean, it means good day, right? It's a, it's a cordial greeting, but how about I see you? I honor you. I, I celebrate you, right? Um, so that's where that comes from. And just a real quick, um, also 
mm, bracket this. Um, I do like to remind people that each of the eight superpowers, as we're going through them, each of them does stand on its own, um, but they do enhance each other. So to your point, run slower and see what's invisible. You could read you could read just one or both, but the when you get better at learning to run slower, you're better able to see what's invisible. They, they sort of feed on each other, if you will. But I always do like to remind people, and this goes back to the, the flux baseline. Um, for most people, I haven't met anybody yet, at least, that there will be certain superpowers that attract you, like just pique your curiosity naturally, and others that you're like, Mm-mm, nope that's not what my script says, or nope, that, that, that rubs me so the wrong way. I am not going there. Right. And I love that because everyone's different and there will be things that excite you and things that completely make you nervous and unravel. And especially those superpowers that make you uncomfortable, pay attention to those because they're like signals of where your relationship to change may need a little extra attention. And again, not judgment, just like go there when you're ready. But the point being, you actually can read the book in any order you want. The, the you could I, I suggest reading the introduction first, but then go where peaks your curiosity. If you want to head to chapter five first, then chapter one, then chapter seven, the book is actually it retains its integrity. And so I love bringing that up because it's just very reader friendly in that regard. But as you read one chapter, it helps you see and understand the others so that I don't want to say one plus one equals 11, but kind of has that additive effect. What we were saying about the whole idea of, of you know, um, treating things like it could be the last time you see somebody, but also the the whole idea, you know, we talk about active listening as a superpower, as a skill for the 21st century, but also is, you know, if that's too much time for you to actively listen to somebody, which is, it's challenging for people, you could start by seeing them, like when you greet them, see them, look them in the eye, you know, try try it with your partner and see what difference it makes. I mean, it it changes again. It goes back to what I said about Wayne Dyer: change what you see and what you see changes. It's so important. It's such it's such a beautiful way to influence your world because you start to create your world that way. And also, just this notion of um, back to our scripts, right? Um, every person on the planet is taught to see some things and not see the rest. We're taught to see usually whatever we've determined societally, whatever matters, we see that. We don't see the rest. And this means, you know, this superpower is all, is helping people, helping us identify our blind spots, but also identifying new insights, new opportunities, things we've been missing because we didn't see them. And I know it sounds a little bit vague and even woo-woo, but like nobody on the planet sees the full picture. We see oftentimes the version of the world we want to see. We see the version that serves us. We don't see people, and here just broadly speaking, um, issues like homelessness. You pass someone on the street without a home. Do you really see them? If you really saw them, you would try to help them, I think. Um, We don't see people who don't have a lot of, um, I shouldn't say, it's not about just about money, but we, banks see you based on how much money you have. They don't see you for being an entrepreneur who's on their way up and, you know, going to be there, has incredible potential, but maybe not a lot of financial resources, whatever. Like we see some things we don't see others. Systemic injustice is rife. I mean, with what we see and don't see. Um, And so part of where I'm coming from, because all of this I'm looking at from the from the backdrop of what happens when change hits, what, you know, who is able to navigate it better. And the challenge is that the things we can't, the things we don't see, the stuff that we've been taught not to see, when change hits, that's the stuff that actually gets us into trouble. That's the stuff that keeps us with very narrow vision, tunnel vision, not seeing the full picture, if you will. And so learning how to, as we say, see what's invisible or make the invisible visible ultimately helps us navigate change better. It gives us a greater breadth of perspective. It gives us bigger horizons. Again, back to what you're saying about seeing a person, a, a person in their whole self, seeing them as fully human, not as some kind of 
perfection or some kind of model, but seeing even the greatest leaders, I mean, this is what I love, the greatest leaders will also be the first ones to tell you about the challenges they've had, the struggles they've faced, the things that they're not, you know, proud of, et cetera. Um, That's seeing a person in their full humanity. And the more we can see one another as full humans, the better we can care for one another, the better we can show up fully human, and the better we can navigate change together. Beautiful. And that chapter is packed full of many ways we can see more. You know, you talk about diversity, you talk about yin and yang of the universe, the wholeness, as you say. You talk about privilege as well. Most, the thing about privilege is we're unaware of it. And you talk about that, seeing through privilege as well, and also appreciating the privilege that we we are born into. But moving on to superpower three is a beautiful one to get lost. And I'll start with a beautiful quote you cite by Rebecca Solnit here that goes as follows. Lost really has two disparate meanings. Losing things is about the familiar falling away, but getting lost is about the unfamiliar appearing. And I'll add to that your own beautiful line. In the landscape of change, getting lost is how you find your way. I love this uh, superpower. And I think, again, to frame it, kind of going back to our scripts again, right? Think about what a lot of us are taught about getting lost. If you get lost, how do we, how do we see that? We see that as somehow you failed. You lost your way. You didn't know where you were going. You screwed up. Getting lost is seen as a negative. And yet when change hits, and here, perfect example, I would say, how many people over the last two years at some point have felt completely lost, right? Just lost in like, what in the world is going on? What does next week hold? What does tomorrow hold? What do we do? How do we make our way forward? And to realize that that's not a judgment against you. Like no one knows. We're all collectively lost. In some in some fashion, right? Because we're we're charting on un, we're charting unknown territory at this point, and we all have to go outside of our comfort zones. And what this superpower brings about is it shows that actually getting lost is not a sign of failure or not knowing what you're doing. Getting lost is a natural part of the human condition, and in a world in flux, there's going to be more of that. And the people who will thrive are those who are not only comfortable getting lost and being lost, but that actively embrace it and actually look out, look for um, opportunities to get themselves lost, to be forced to stretch beyond their comfort zone, to be nudged to see, again, seeing how the superpowers overlap, see new things. Because go back to when you get lost, how do you, what typically happens, right? Sometimes you can feel afraid. It can be, there are definitely cases in which danger is involved. But for a lot of people, in a lot of cases too, Think about a trip you take and you get lost, right? You, oops, took the wrong turn. Off we go. We're somewhere we didn't know where we were going to be. Those excursions, those detours often end up being some of the most cherished memories. They end up being when you discovered that place that wasn't even on your map, but turned out to be the place that no one else had discovered or, you know, where you had some kind of new insight that you wouldn't have had if you've stuck to the beaten path. Right. So all of these things going beyond your comfort zone, um, discovering new things that you didn't even know were there, those sorts of things all feed into this superpower as well. And it very much goes back to my relationship with my dad in particular. Um, He was a cultural geographer. So both of my parents were educators. Um, Learning and travel and all of that was super important. We didn't have a lot of stuff. There was there was not a lot of money or, or things. But there was an immense appreciation for um, for learning, for travel, for other humans. And my dad, as a cultural geographer, he was constantly studying how do people and plants and animals like migrate and and how do we like get to know one another, right? So diversity was just a huge theme in our family. And he would always remind me, um, the more different someone is from you, the more interesting they are to get to know. He would always say to me, like, why do you want, he's res- with all due respect to everybody, why would you want to hang out with people who look like you and eat like you and think like you? Like, that doesn't seem very fun. Like, go find that person that is the most unlike you and get to know them. You'll learn more. They'll learn from you. You'll have a more 
rich experience, if you will. And I bring this up also, though, because it feeds directly into the getting lost. Getting lost almost by default means that you're going to learn something new, encounter someone new, do something new, and that that is to be cherished and celebrated, but also that it serves you well more broadly in life. I was thinking when you were saying that about your dad's influence, and I actually had it in my notes here, the influence of your dad later on, because you travel extensively, you did travel extensively, you still do with, with keynotes, etc., and your consulting work all over the world. But I thought about I write a weekly article and one of the reasons I write April is to arrange my own thinking and educate myself actually through the writing. And one one of the ideas that dawned on me from and this is probably a couple of years ago I wrote this was I studied French and German and in French class in college we had to le read a lot of um, literature and, and novels and stuff. But one of the classes we talked about the origins of fairy tales. And one of them was Le, Le Petit Chaperon Rouge, the re Little Red Riding Hood. And we talked about the multiple versions of that. And, you know, when you're sitting through that in college and you're 20, you're kind of going, what the hell am I learning this for? And then years later, it pays off, which is beautiful. But the way it paid off for me was when I thought about the cultural significance of those fairy tales that were intended to be read to children, that particular story is to warn little girls from not wandering off the beaten path. And I thought about the social programming that comes with that, the social scripting to keep everybody on the well-worn path. Don't go wandering, wandering equals danger. That we consistently do that through a wide range of media. It's no longer just fairy tales if anybody reads them anymore, but it's constantly through, as you say, scripts written by other people that we follow. There is probably a whole other conversation around children's books, particularly historical ones, less so today, but um, my husband has a particular fascination with this sort of thing too. And he grew up internationally and we have some of these older storybooks too. And I mean, I don't want to dramatize, but like I look at this storybook and it's, if I were five, it's petrifying. I mean, it is danger and death and violence. like we're scaring kids into, well, and this feeds into another superpower, but to not trust anybody, to follow that script written by society to a T, cut off your curiosity, cut off your agency, cut off, like straight and narrow. Here we go. Right. And I think about this and I'm like, oh, no wonder we're all kind of twisted up like pretzels today, struggling to break free of some of this stuff because it was ingrained at a time when we did not realize as children what was going on necessarily. And, you know, in fairness, and I always say this about my parents and, and any parent out there, I think, you know, my parents did the best with what they had. They didn't have a playbook for how to parent. They didn't have, you know, they had their own baggage and their own scripts that they were trying to release from, et cetera. But you're right. I mean, children's books in terms of getting lost, it is drilled into us from a very young age, getting lost is bad. And I do understand there's an element, particularly, you know, as a parent, yes, you want to protect your children. You don't want them to get lost that you can't find them kind of thing. You don't want them to get into really bad trouble. I get that. Those storybooks are something, they're of a factor far, far, far beyond that. Um, I will say it's interesting, and this has only come up it's come up repeatedly as I talk about my dad. Um, and I think for all of us, just when we reflect on our, our relationship with our parents and our, our childhood, and I think most kids, like I, there were parts of my childhood that I feel very lucky for. There were other aspects that were really, really challenging and really hard. Um, I'm grateful for all of it because it made me who I am, even though there are probably some things that you know, we do differently next time. Um, but the fact that my dad, every morning, I mean, he would drill into me both this notion of the more different someone is from you, the more interesting they are to get to know. But there was also this, um, this encouragement of the world is so much bigger than your own backyard. Like you have an opportunity, like a duty, almost an obligation to go explore it. And it wasn't like my parents were going to pay for me to go travel. They were like, go find out what this big, amazing, you know, somewhat crazy, somewhat challenging world, but go, go explore this world. 
And getting lost was never a negative thing. It was like, just go see what's there and, and don't judge it, just learn from it. And also though, this notion that the fact that I was a girl and got to go to school, those two things, that made me one of the luckiest kids on the planet. It wasn't about what I had or how I looked or any of that. It was this sense of if, if I was a girl and I got, got an education, I was lucky. And as a result of that good fortune, I also had a duty or a responsibility to give back. And what that really meant for them was that I could never see my career about me. It needed to be a career of service. And there were lots of ways I could serve. But that, you know, I, I bring this up largely because I thought that was kind of the Kool-Aid that all kids were taught to drink. I thought that was just part of everyone's socialization, right? And it was only much later in life that I realized, no, that is not what all children are taught. And so more broadly, I bring this up, like children are sponges and what we teach them will shape how they are able to show up and, you know, cascade into their families, their friends, their communities. And it's funny because I do think the get lost superpower, so to speak, is one that I was encouraged to pursue very, very young. It's one that I did not realize how many other people were not encouraged to or taught to be afraid of it. It's a beautiful one. And, and I've, I've massively benefited from traveling. I traveled same 20 year old and was encouraged to do so. I wasn't I wasn't uh, encouraged actively, but I wasn't prevented from it. And it made such a huge difference to me, you know, because your brain absolutely changes. But you mentioned there briefly trust, and it, it's a really important one to start with trust. Uh, people do often ask me, they're like, which is your favorite superpower, right? And I'm always like, that's like asking which is your favorite child. You do not answer that question. But I do often say that the this it's the fourth superpower. Start with trust. That's okay. Start with trust. I think of it as the super superpower because it trust fuels and powers more than anything else when it comes to navigating change well. So again, here, the diagnostic, the questions, the questions that show up in each um, chapter are helpful. I would say these ones always come to mind. Our relationship to trust, starting there and seeing how it affects how we navigate and think about change. So the, the easiest way to begin this one is when change hits, who do you turn to? When you don't know what to do, who do you turn to? You turn to your trusted relationships. And if you don't have them, you're in a world of hurt far greater than people who do. Trust is kind of this glue. It's like the connective tissue that holds families and communities and teams and organizations together. It's what fosters respect and loyalty, the willingness to go the extra mile. Um, there's We could have spent all of our time just on trust, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Trust is both cognitive and emotional. So cognitive trust means trusting that someone is reliable and dependable, that they'll do what they say they'll do, right? But emotional trust is trusting that another person will care about you and have your back and look out for you. And so I think as many listeners, I'm sure know, we're in the midst of this trust crisis globally. We have all-time low levels of trust in business and in government and media and academia and Trust just feels like it's being frayed again and again and again. And that does not bode well at all for a world and a future in flux. Um, it does not bode well for our urgent, um, absolutely essential need to navigate constant change well. But it also gives us this huge opportunity to rethink how we think about change, but also, as the book goes on to set, to share, how we design our systems and institutions and relationships from um, a basic premise of trust. And this goes into the fact that when we think about why are we stuck in such a trust crisis, and again, we could talk about this for hours, but part of the problem, I believe, is that we have designed many of our systems, institutions, assumptions and expectations even, from the basic premise that the average individual cannot and should not be trusted. So all else equal, Aiden, I should not trust you and you, you should not trust me. That, that's, again, that's our script. And yet, what have we just done? We've just cut ourselves off from one another right when we might have been able to help one another. 
And a lot of this, um, you know, you go back into history and you you see how systems got designed from a, a basic assumption of mistrust. But as a result, what it means is when we don't know whether to trust or not, we default into mistrust. And that feeds on itself again and again and again. And then we're left going, my goodness, is there anyone I can trust? When you think about it, though, no child is born into the world not trusting like children are the epitome. They will trust. There's a certain element that adults need to do to unlearn all of the, the layers of mistrust. And I'm not talking about blind trust or naive trust. I'm talking about the average. Where do we default? Do we default that the average person is trustworthy and wants what's good for another or that the average person has it out for everyone else, right? Anyway, back to the children. We are taught to not trust. And insofar as we are taught to not trust, we can also unlearn that behavior as well. And we can design differently that begins with a premise of trust. I need to knock that trust out of you by reading your Little Red Riding Hood, April. <laughs> no, I know. Well, I will say we collect children's books actually from around the world. We oh, don't wow. collect that many things, but it's one of those things I've always, for whatever reason, my seven-year-old self like the picture books from different cultures. Wow. And I will say I'm very encouraged. The books that, have, that are written today are not this narrative, right? So there's hope. But I think a lot of parents still want their kids to read the classics, right? Everyone gets that, whether it's Little Red Riding Hood, um, whether it's Richard Scarry, whether it's Goldilocks. I mean, and there are helpful narratives in there, but there are also, there's this subtext that's like, whoa, <laughs> we really need to be reading this in 2021 or 2022, yeah. I should say, soon. I, I find the, the Aesop fables useful still, but they're kind of like, I have to really, uh, I really have to boost them up with some like imagination in there to make them interesting as well. But I, I, I'll, move on, I'll move on to the next superpower. And, and I actually, the next superpower is something that I've experienced myself uh, in, in awakening of sorts is that and it probably goes back to what you were saying about the shifts from an old mindset to a flux mindset where you you stop part of you stops caring because you've changed your script of social scripting where you're not no longer measured on what car you drive or what clothes you wear or how much money you have in the bank or or even if you're if you're doing well you don't need to express that to anyone you don't need to share that off and uh, and the other question you ask is a much bigger one then. And that this one is about knowing what is your enough. And again, I'd love you to share this, the word nerd that you are, the origin of the word enough is beautiful as well. So this superpower, know you're enough, is all about our, what I will call our obsession with more, <laughs> but also our quest for true happiness and satisfaction. And the punchline, I'll just, I'll jump to the, I'll, I'll jump to the punchline and I'll come back. The punchline is that when we are always after ever more, so, and not just more money or more power, but more likes, more love, more clicks, more followers, like more everything, right? When we are always after ever more, we will never find enough. By design, it can't happen. So think about it. I want more and more pick, pick, you know, fill in the blank with whatever the more is. I want more. And then what happens when you get it? You want more and more. And it's this kind of vicious cycle that's keeping us mostly miserable. And so knowing you're enough, and here people often say, is this a typo? Knowing you're enough, Y O U R, which is your point of sufficiency and balance and satisfaction, it includes knowing that you are enough just as you are, we'll come back to this in a minute, when you know you're enough, you immediately begin to see abundance. So it's a, it's a shift in just, again, how you see. So the word enough, this was fascinating to look at the etymology. Um, the part about the history of this word that I like the most is that for much of human history, and again, you look at ancient Greek, but then you look at like Albanian and old English and different languages, um, enough typically related to how much you could carry. So enough was, you know, not too much, not too little, 
how much you could carry. And it also relates to things like how we thought of the economy and so forth. It was householding. How much you and your family needed was enough. And here's the interesting thing. More than enough was considered excess. It was considered overhang. And even today, I love using the analogy of when you travel and you pack and you have luggage. When you take a trip, how much do you want to have for a really awesome trip? You want to have just enough. You want to have the things that you need to travel. But anyone who's taken a trip and has an extra suitcase along, you know what a pain that is, right? You're lugging it around. It's excess. You don't need it. And then you start wondering, why did I bring all this stuff? I didn't need it. So the enough is how much can you carry that satisfies the needs of you and historically your family? And I love that because it kind of reframes where and how did we get caught on this hamster wheel, if you will, this obsession with more. And both economics and psychology are at play. In particular, over the last hundred-ish years, we've been living in this hyper-consumer world where consumerism is sort of ruling the day. To the point that we use the term consumer, we call ourselves consumers without thinking about it. It's just like a word we use. And yet, did you know that the original meaning of the word consume is to destroy? So like consumed by fire. For most of human history, consumption was not something we were encouraged to do. It was something that killed us, right? So where I, I just sort of, again, say like, time out. How did we end up in this ridiculous situation in which it's more, 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 and we define ourselves by more is better, more is better, even though we know, A, we're living unsustainably on the planet, but B, and this has become a real concern of mine, particularly when I meet and speak with younger people, how many people, and again, it skews young, how many people by the time they're at university, if not younger, they've already convinced themselves that they will never have or do or earn or most worrisome, that they'll never be enough because they've been, they've been fed this diet of more. And so anyway, knowing you're enough, which includes knowing that you are enough, this is actually not only how we reassess what really matters and who we are, but it also helps us navigate change better because in that when change hits, that more often becomes excess. That more becomes at the best case scenario, what you want to do with excess is actually share it with others. So we start getting into issues around generosity, reciprocity, that sort of thing as well. Again, so important. Again, you, you mentioned about the influence of young people, but even as a parent, not to be passing on the measurement of the old world to your children um, and th the language we use. And this is where I think all the superpowers work together also, but the scripting, the rescripting. If we have enough people in society who are writing new scripts for a new world, you, you gently nudge other people around you. So if somebody starts kind of going, hey, I, I got a new car, and you're kind of going, I actually don't care. I don't really not into cars. <laughs> They're usually like, oh, okay, so cars aren't a good measure. So maybe not, maybe I shouldn't have got the car. And then, then it starts to positively change other people's mindsets as well. So but there's a thing you said there about the socialization of children, but also you were getting towards people coming into college. So if the whole idea is, oh, I'm coming into college with the idea of having, you know, the the the, the American dream or whatever it might be that, that I've been fed by advertising and now the shows that I watch and all these different subscription channels. So th that plants the, the, the schema for me. And if we can get in the way of that, we can start to interrupt it, change what you see, what you see changes. But this comes to a really important one and and one we'll touch on now because I have a, an episode on this in a few weeks in, in, about the gig mindset and not the whole gig economy because that's a very different thing. But something that you have perfected, something that I am working on constantly is the idea of a portfolio career, which is oftentimes uh, like I, when I was reading that chapter about your experience, I had the same thing. People are kind of going, when, when are you going to, you know, settle down and just do one thing? Now I did. I, I played professional sport. I played, I spent almost a decade in one, in one industry, which, you know, 
some people will be going, going well, whoop de doo you should be there for 50 years. But that, that's what's changed. The, the world has absolutely changed. And I'm going to introduce this with a very important quote by you and another one by Jerry Garcia. Garcia said, you don't want to be the best at what you do. You want to be the only one. That's such an important mindset for people. And I say that to say, and I'm talking specifically because many of my students, uh, one of my part of my portfolio career is lecturing and students and former students listen to the show. And I'm talking to them directly here because it's kind of like, look, April Rinna said it. It's not me just saying it here. <laughs> so I'm going to frame it in their experiences because you tell us early on in your 20s, people gave you this is your experience, people gave you all kinds of flack for your portfolio approach. They said your resume no, made no sense and they foreboded that your future would crash. You felt like something was wrong with you because you were interested in so many different things driven by curiosity and wouldn't set, settle on one pursuit. How could you possibly pick just one area of focus, even though everyone else was laser focused on climbing corporate ladders and staking out their domain of expertise? And that's the challenge. I was in a very similar thing. And when you're an 18 year old going into college, you really don't have a clue what you what you want. You, you know, I see your B behind you there, the beautiful picture on the wall. And I, I often think about that. Like, that's what it's like, you're, you're like a bee going from flower to flower to go, which one, what kind of pollen do I dig? What kind of colors do I dig? All this kind of stuff is so important. That's what we should be doing, not actually going laser focus, kid, get into that career, stay in that industry for the rest of your time. Those days are over. I love that you picked up this bumblebee because it's a watercolor that's actually quite abstract. And if you look at it close, people are like, what in the world is that? But then you zoom out and the bumblebee is actually my spirit animal, if you will, right? But because of the cross-pollination. And that's how I loved it. Like not only trying a little bit of this, trying a little bit of that, but then taking insights from one experience and cross-pollinating it somewhere else, bring, connecting new dots, all of that, which feeds into a portfolio. So yes, um, shout out to all of the young students, professionals. I hear you. I see you. I was there. Um, I do want to put this in the context, though, not to keep going back to my parents, but there's this interesting through thread, which is even when, when my parents were alive, I was always the kid that was just interested in a lot of stuff. I was curious and I want to try this and that and all these different things. And then um, after they died, all of a sudden, one, I had to be responsible for myself. I had to grow up fast. Two, I had to figure out what is my career. And again, it had this notion of like, if my time is finite, what do I want to make of my professional life? And I just couldn't shake this feeling that my future and the, the way that I could best serve society was not to get on a ladder and start climbing it. And I, I had mentors and professors at that time, all of whom were quite concerned about my well-being and my future because of what I had been through. And they loved me. I know they had my best interests at heart. And they were all saying, you know, with your credentials, you should go work at an investment bank or a consulting firm. And now all due respect to banks and consulting firms. I've worked with many of them since then. But at that time, I'm like, wait a minute. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I was like, I don't have less than a year to live. I, I don't have more than a year to live. If that's the case, the last place on the planet I should be is a bank or a consulting firm, right? I was just like, there's more for me to experience in life. And there are many more ways I can give back and I can contribute to life. And so I just couldn't shake it. But I was also able to take this mindset. And I will admit, it does take courage. It does take a willingness to step off that beaten path and say, I know what's best for me. I know it, it may or may not work out. And if it doesn't work out, I'll have to adapt and all the rest. But I wouldn't be living a life that's true to myself if I did otherwise. And so society was saying, you know, we think you should turn right. And I was like, I'm taking a hard left, right? And people were like, you're crazy. What are you doing? And I had to keep telling them, listen, I'm not building a career on the metrics you think matter. I guarantee you I'm going to create a career of service. I think it might take me a little longer. It might look a little different, but I'm on it. You know, And 
I have to take care of myself. I had to be self-sufficient. So there was no question of like, I don't know that I was just going to kind of go become a dilettante or something. I had to work. And that changed everything. What's interesting, I still remember that I had um, some, some colleagues who were just giving me all kinds of flack, right? They were like, this makes no sense. You're crazy. You know, we're going to watch you fail kind of thing. And then I started putting together the pieces of my portfolio. And this was several years later. And these two people had climbed the ladder, right? Turns out they were pretty miserable. Some years later, they come back to me and they're like, oh, now we see what you're doing. Hey, how do we do that too? And these were the same people who had just completely like torn me apart years prior. So I share this also because if you're young, have faith as well, like courage and faith, because particularly today, I mean, when I did this many years ago, this was before we had digital nomads and remote work and all of that. Um, Today, there has never been more ways to earn income, to create a business, to work, to serve others, to contribute to society than, than there are now. And that definitely includes traditional jobs. So I'm not ruling, I'm not knocking those in any way, shape, or form. And having a job that teaches you skills and allows you to be part of a big organization, there are benefits in that. And I find that the more experience people have, the more they want to be able to create and curate their own portfolio, their own professional future. And it sets you up well to do that as well. Yeah. And that that word you said there is so important, curate. Like that's what we're doing. We're curating the, you know, back to your, your B, you're curating which flowers actually resonate with me, which ones can provide me an income, those kind of things become so important. I'd love to, I'd love to spend more time on portfolio career, you spend a lot of time on there, and you pose lots of great questions for ourselves. But one thing that's important before we move on to the seventh, uh, super, uh, the se- seventh skill is how education needs to change because again if you talk about scripts the educational script is is not fitting for a portfolio career approach it tends to keep people in their swim lane and we want people to be able to experience the full ocean and i think there is and this is where the last two years again this all predates the last two years but the last two years have been a huge catalyst for education system education systems, plural, across the board to recognize just how much of a disconnect there is. I have been doing some work with universities, but in particular, the career services centers, right? The ones that are tasked. So we can look at how do we need to upgrade curriculum and what's taught in the classroom. But at the end of the day, especially at the university level, what's their goal? Place students in jobs. So again, they're looking at jobs. They're looking at the straight path. And um, it's been really interesting. They realize that if they can't meet that metric, which again is working for fewer and fewer students, meeting fewer and fewer goals, then they have a different kind of existential crisis, right? So they get it, but it is going to take time. Some career services centers, I find this really interesting. Very few of them, if any, they don't have like a a portfolio career approach um, or module or offering or anything like that. But many career services centers are rebranding themselves as life design centers, which is interesting because it's at least a nod to there's something more than just getting a job and getting on that, you know, that uh, treadmill. There is a much bigger, I mean, again, as with all of these, I feel like we could spend the rest of our time just on this. Um, There's a bigger conversation around, I do not believe actually that 10 years from now, a four-year college degree or three years in some countries, right? But that a college degree, it's going to be one of many options to define and and spur your entry into the workforce. But it's not going to be the kind of gold star, gold standard credential that it is today. It's useful. But what we're learning now, there are so many ways to learn skills and to launch businesses and to do things. So I bring this up because it's all very, very messy, um, but I see messy as good. Educational institutions, though, it's those that actually are willing to be the real innovators and try radically different things, experiment, innovate, have, offer students the ability. I mean, I, I think of, my hope is that down the road, all educational universe, all educational institutions will 
start talking about careers as portfolios and start helping students create and curate their portfolios even before they graduate. Because one of the things I love to bring up here is that every single person, so if you're listening and you're 15 or you're 50, every person on the planet already has a portfolio. You may not realize it. It doesn't require that you've worked and earned income. Everybody has a portfolio of skills, of capabilities, of things they can offer. Um, Your portfolio is far more than your resume. Also, unlike a job, and this is where there's sort of a dose of reality, any job, even if you love your job, even if you're really good at your job, if someone else gave you that job, it can always be taken away. And I think that, not just great resignation, but in general, that's what's making a lot of people really nervous about the future of work. I've got this career, I'm climbing my way up the ladder, but actually the whole thing could change tomorrow. That's very scary for a lot of people. And what I like to remind them is, so long as a job is given to you, it can be taken away. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. Your portfolio is yours. You're responsible for it. You create it, you curate it, but no one can ever take it away from you. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to adapt and try new things. And I'm, you know, 30 years in, I'm still layering and adding things to my portfolio every day, just as you are, right, Aiden? And yet, no one can take it away from you. It's always yours. And it's yours to offer to others and, you know, serve them in more ways as well, back to the cross pollinating and whatnot. As you, build and curate your portfolio, you discover new ways to combine what's in it, which leads to new offerings, new insights, et cetera. Again, to your cross-pollination, when I was growing up, one of the joys I had, a nice early memory, childhood memory, was my parents had a garden center, and we used to, my, my nana, my granny, used to create these beautiful bouquets of flowers and sell them for people for, you know, weddings and stuff like that or whatever. And... I when you were talking about the curation, I thought about the bouquet and I was like, because sometimes there'd be, you know, she'd put in a flower and it, it like wouldn't be great. And she'd go, oh, I'm going to have to remove this one and put in a different one. And they'd create wreaths for for funerals, etc. And that's what I, I thought of. That's the image that came to mind when I thought about the curation of a bouquet of skill sets and that some of those skill sets need to be let go of because they're no longer relevant. But the remnants are still relevant. I think that's really important as well as the remnants of those skills, because sometimes they won't work out the way you'd hoped, but they're, that's also got its lesson. It's like, well, you don't really like this and you wouldn't have pursued it because you're not that curious about it. So that's such an important thing. There's two more superpowers. Can I add one? I, oh, please, I've please do. i got to just chime in here because there's just two very quick things. I love that you bring up the bouquets and the flowers. Um, I've had people think about, so I say portfolio and there are different kinds of portfolios, right? An artist has a portfolio, an investor has a portfolio. We talk about um, the latter. I've had people say, no, 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 my career is more like a jungle gym where I'm climbing over and around it, or it's not a ladder, it's a lattice. I've used the analogy of a flower. I love that, but a flower that continues to bloom year after year after year and gets bigger, I might actually have to use the bouquet one now. As Please, well, we'll take it. it. <laughs> but it's so, it, it's so good. Um, And so I bring that up also because people like different analogies. They like different concepts in their head. And I'm like, okay, try jungle gym, try bouquet, try, um, you know, artists portfolio, try investment portfolio, like try on whatever, try on different clothes and see what fits you best. Yeah. So awesome. Awesome. Well, great. And it works well with the bee as well, because the bee tests out the flower. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) totally. And by the way, I don't know, do you know about the waggle dance from the bee kingdom? Do you know about that? Is this, you're saying the dance that the bees do? Yeah, the innovation dance. No. Yeah, so, no, so, I don't know that. Yeah, I was only saying this to my kid the other day. That's why I, I mentioned it to you, is that in any population of, of animals or any kingdom, there's, there's a different type of personality that does a different role. So if you were to drop a piece of apple into a room full of ants, only about 80% would go to the piece of information, which is the apple and check it out. The rest, some would go and check out what if there's strawberries around here and others would go still and go, well, actually I better not go near it in case it's poisoned because then the whole species dies. But in the bee kingdom, they have these bees that will go and investigate 
unknown territories. And of course, the way they tr- they the way they communicate that is through the dance. And they'll do this dance called a waggle dance, which is look, hey, I che- I found some really interesting stuff over here. You got to check it out, and then that communicates to everyone else, and then they come along and explore it again. So, I thought it worked well with your bee. I love this. Thank. You. Well, I'm co- constantly collecting examples of flux, right, uh, or or ways in which this actually shows up in nature, um, at the in the workplace. You name it. So you've just added actually two examples: the bouquet and the waggle dance. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> A pleasure. You inspired you inspired me. So let's let's get on to that. Uh, the next one then is the whole idea of being more human and you know it reminded me of a kind of a a moment for me when I was working in in digital transformation I used to have a saying that the 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 more the world becomes digital the more we need to be human and I was taught what I was talking about really was that as people use more apps and websites at the time this was er, er, noughties that we need to start to put on more concerts and more experiences if it because this was the radio industry. And I was like, so we need to move away from radio towards entertainment and towards conviviality and bringing people together. And people laughed at me. <laughs> and I, I used to get angry about that. I used to, and, and then but I was really more angry at myself that how am I not finding a good way to communicate that. So one of the great things that has taught me this journey of transformation is is to have empathy just because somebody laughs at you is is a sign usually of communication that they don't don't either understand you or they have a different mental model of what you mean but this is such an important skill in an age of flux is being more human and so this one this superpower and again we see how it starts folding back on some of the others as well being seen showing up fully human um It's really about our relationship, humans' relationship to technology and the tension that we face in that we are spending ever more time with our devices and yet ever less time with one another. And again, all of this goes back to, and what does that mean for how we navigate change, right? And what I find is that, and again, I I am married to a technologist. I was born and raised in San Francisco. Technology, I work with technology companies. I'm not I am not anti-tech in any way, shape, or form. There's just this notion that technology, not only is it only a means to an end, not an end in and of itself, but also whether it helps or harms people really depends on intentions. And we are on a slippery slope right now, I would say, in terms of how we think about technology. And in particular, what I have found in my work and research and whatnot is that um, the more devices we have in our pockets, the more apps on any given device, the more we live on technology, the more, and again, this isn't script per se, but it's part of our mental conditioning. The more we're led to believe that technology can solve any problem. And yet when change really hits, nothing could be further from the truth. Like when we don't know what to do, there's no piece of technology that's going to be like, poof, think about the last two years, right? Yeah. I mean, apps have been helpful to get from point A to point B and make our um, vaccination appointments and whatnot. But technology is, it's not going to reconcile or remedy or help us walk through those fires of uncertainty. What we need for that is one another. What we need for that is human relationships. And to the extent that technology facilitates those, great. But we're now living in a world in which the human connection and then add, you know, lockdown and social distancing and all the rest to that, we're fraying a lot of those human um, human bonds. And so be all the more human. There are a few different ways this plays out, but really it's about recalibrating our relationship to technology in ways that allow us to be all the more human. And so it's interesting. There's a piece and um You might have heard of the whole concept of DQ, so digital intelligence. Uh, So there's IQ and EQ and DQ. And a lot of times people think, oh, DQ, um, that means being super tech savvy and knowing how to build an app. And I'm always like, no, DQ, which is a great um, component, I would say, of being all the more human. Having high DQ means knowing when to put your device down and have a face-to-face conversation. It means knowing how to responsibly manage your screen time. It means knowing how to call out digital identity theft or cyberbullying and and to protect others as well. And all of those sorts of things that allow us to be all the more human. 
And then in addition to the technology piece, just this notion that um, when we have to hide feelings, when we have to show up as something less than who we fully are, and here we have things like, can you show up and be vulnerable? Can you show up and share your fears? Can you, can you show all of the sides of you? Not just the strong side, not just the side that shows up on Facebook and Instagram. Can you show up as fully you? Those are the kinds of connections and the kind of openness that we need in order, again, to navigate change well. Beautiful. And you can see again how that, that ties to everything else. Trust is important, for example, to even be vulnerable. You need to have trust of the other person to show vulnerability. If you're a leader of an organization, for the for example, I think, you know, leading by an expression of vulnerability is massive, but you need to trust the people around you have your back as well. And that kind of going, Aiden's lost it. He's in there being vulnerable. Exactly. There's so <laughs> much this, I would say of all the superpowers, well, they all factor in, but around leadership and comfort with ambiguity. Um, actually, the last two superpowers, I've talked so much about this in the context of leadership. And there is a way to be vulnerable and still responsible. And teams, colleagues, humans, they notice it. They show up. We do not want leaders to be sort of out there with the superhero jackets going like, I have all the answers, because the fact is they don't. No one knows. That's what I love to say. No one knows. Let's stop pretending that we do. But let's also use this as an opportunity to open up how we can all lead, learn, grow, find solutions, et cetera, together. And there's one last skill that's important for all this. And it's important for so many reasons. One is to create space for other things to come in. But the other is actually to create cognitive capacity as well. And this is the skill of letting go of the future. And I'm going to set you up with a beautiful quote by Lao Tzu. When I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. And in this context, I loved another Sanskrit term that you introduce here. And I hope I pronounce it right. Aparigraha. Aparigraha. Exactly. So, um, and you'll see like in the book where I've got, sometimes I'm bringing my futurist lens to the, to the table. Other times I'm bringing my travel and cultural lens to the table. Eastern philosophies, Western philosophies, like it's all layered in there. And the Parigraha, um, it is Sanskrit. And um, it is part of what most people know of today as classic yoga philosophy. It's one of the, um, the actual, the, there are these things called yamas and niyamas, and they're principles for life, but they come from the yogic tradition. So it's one of those. And a Parigraha is basically uh, non-attachment. And so this ability to let go. And so back to the whole letting go of the future, um, I always have to give the caveat people, this is the one where most people are like, uh-uh, like, nope, not going there. This rubs me completely the wrong way. This is ultimately about our relationship to control and our comfort with ambiguity. And I could have made the title a little bit longer and said, we need to let go of our need, our obsession with wanting to predict and control the future, but letting go of the future just kind of, it's a nice way to tee it up and, and peak curiosity. It's actually a really empowering, uplifting message though, because what I'm trying to say is we as humans collectively are so, pardon my speech, hellbent on needing to know what's going to happen, needing to predict the future as if there's one future that could play out, needing to control the outcomes, all of this sort of stuff, that when we're thrown into change that we can't control, when we're thrown into a world in flux, this is where we really start to unravel. We can't control. We don't know. We start to. It's like a tailspin of anxiety. And yet, when you're able to learn how to let go of those things you can't control, not only, to your point, do you open up space and breathe oxygen into other possible futures that could emerge, you actually find it's really empowering because you start to realize that what you were after, this notion of like, I need to con control and predict the future, it was just an illusion of control. It's all been an illusion because the fact is neither you nor I nor anyone has ever been able to predict the future. We can only predict or control how we respond, right? We've probably heard that. Neither you nor I nor anyone can predict the outcome or control one singular outcome, but we can control whether and how we contribute to an outcome we'd like to see. 
And so being able to let go of the future allows you to actually imagine new possibles, different possibles, new futures, and so forth. So, you know, it's a kind of, there's a bit of a head fake here. Each one of the superpowers, I would say, is counterintuitive in some way. What I'm saying is that by knowing how to let go of the future, you actually are able to play a much more proactive role in the different possible futures that could come about and your role in them and setting yourself up for success. Beautiful and a wonderful way to r start wrapping things up. I have a final quote, April, that I'm going to share, which is my sign off today, but I'd love you to finish today's show. Before I, I give that quote and before you give your final message to our audience, where can people find you? People to you have a lot of resources from the book as well that are available as well for people who've bought the book. Where can they find out about your keynotes, your workshops, etc.? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. So for all things Flux, go to fluxmindset.com. That's the book, lots more resources, articles, you name it. Um, I do also maintain aprilrinney.com. Um, that is more my personal site, but didn't come up on our conversation today. It usually does in terms of see what's invisible. Um, I do handstands. And so you can find my handstands on aprilrinney.com. But I would say start with fluxmindset.com. Um, and thank you again for having me. My final quote is as follows. Life will give you plenty of opportunities to practice opening your flux mindset and developing your flux superpowers. Don't overthink things. Start with whatever change related challenge is facing you at the moment. And no matter what, remember, these aren't skills just for today, or just this year, or just the issue that flipped your world upside down yesterday. These are superpowers you can harness forever. Remember, I have a copy up for grabs, just sign up to the innovation show.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to win a copy of this beautiful book. I love the colors, by the way, April as well, the beautiful uh, the word the way the, the choice of the color for flux is great, very uh, stands out and pops. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm going to hand to you to close today's show. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aiden. It has been a joy. Yes, I love my cover designer. And let me just thank everyone for tuning in today and for your time and your attention. And as I like to say, I mean, we've got a new year, more change ahead, more flux ahead. Um, and when everything is in flux, or at least almost everything, everything can benefit from a flux mindset. Author of Flux, Eight Superpowers for Thriving in Constant Change, April Rinney, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And as always, thank you to our partners over at Zai at Global Fintech, which is innovating within its area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. You can check them out at hellozai.com. See you next week.